Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> well, it's um, great to see so many old friends, and it's really great fun to be up here on the Arctic Circle, surrounded by so many right-thinking people. Uh, we are privileged to be among the world's leading experts on the rigging of the gold market by central banks and their agents, plus some first-rate economic thinkers who can tell us what to expect upon the inevitable failure of that rig. Now, I don't have anything to add to um, what these experts and thinkers have to say about those issues. Instead, I'd like to um, talk about the way forward for GATA, as I see it. <clears throat> I speak as, a, um, as an early and as a um, long-time supporter. Um, and as a direct beneficiary of what uh, GATA has achieved to date in its capacity as what has to be the noisiest and the crankiest educational charity in the history of the Internal Revenue Code. I stumbled onto it about the same time I stumbled onto gold uh, back in the late uh, 1990s. I was on the prowl for a profitable trade. I'd had a checkered career as a securities lawyer, an investment banker, and most recently a carpetbagger. More politely, a private equity investor in emerging markets formerly part of the Soviet, late Soviet empire. I was looking for a value or a convergence play with the potential to become another Eastern Europe. Gold jumped out as a natural. There was no market more out of whack then or now than gold. There was even a fat old lady singing at the time in the form of the Bank of England dumping the Crown's reserves. And it, in retrospect, it turns out, uh, who knows, uh, maybe, maybe a little something from some other country's reserves as well. It's not entirely clear whose is what down there in the vaults. Anyway, as I was reading up on the subject, I noticed that a couple of nutcases had raised the Jolly Roger on the internet. They were alleging, of all things, massive fraud in the very market I was trying to understand. Now this piqued my interest. I was young and cynical. You don't spend a lot of time on Wall Street or in the adventure capital end of the private equity business without running across rigged markets. In fact, if there was a price-fixing cartel at work, so much the better. A nimble outsider can make good money busting or riding cartels. But as I got into it, I learned the gold market was not like, say, amino acids or potash. Here, the price of an asset was being suppressed, not supported, and not by users, but by owners, and not for obvious reasons. I'd never run into this pattern before. If you own a lot of something, why run a cartel to keep its price down? I quickly came in contact with other people who'd homed in on God as beacon. They helped me to understand the bigger picture, that gold is money, real money, and as such, poses a mortal threat to the fiat dollar-based monetary system. The preservation of the bank's power to create what we use as money is infinitely more important than the price of a portfolio asset. That's why it was foolish to expect the central banks to act as economic entities. The only reason the banks held on, or pretended to hold on, to their gold inventories was to maintain their control over the market and to keep the exchange value down in relation to their competing paper franchise. This realization was part of a greater intellectual awakening that put the rig in context. The fact is the struggle between state power and market-based money has been ongoing for many years and has defined, among other things, the economic history of the 20th century. The current rig is just the most recent and the most sophisticated manifestation of this struggle. Now all this was news to me. I had received a good education. I would even spent several years at a bulge bracket investment bank specializing in financial institutions. But I was completely ignorant on the history and nature of money. Now this was obviously partly due to my own shortcomings as a student. But it was also due to the fact that in today's America these subjects are simply not taught in school or discussed in polite company. If you want to learn the truth about money, you have to find it on your own. As an aside, back in law school, I was a class ahead of Judge John Roberts, President Bush's nominee to replace Sandra Day O'Connor on the Supreme Court. I didn't know him. He must have hung out with the smart kids. Actually, there was no reason why I would have known him. We were all wound pretty tight back then, focusing on how we were going to wield power and influence when we came of age. 
I didn't know a number of my own more prominent classmates. Scott Turow, for example, was busy writing novels. Mike Chertoff was busy with the Young Americans for Fascism. And Barney Frank was, well, let's not go there. <laughs> But however smart Judge Roberts is, and I have no doubt that he is very smart indeed, I'd be willing to bet that he has no idea what the U.S. Constitution says about money. If he does, he sure didn't get it at Harvard Law School. Now, for the benefit of anyone with us today from the Department of Homeland Security, I was just kidding about junior fascists. There's no such organization at Harvard Law School, and um, Secretary Chertoff certainly didn't belong if there were. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank and salute those two wild and crazy guys, Bill Murphy and Chris Powell, for getting fed up six years ago and deciding that they weren't going to take it anymore. They set up a shelter for the intellectually homeless and the hungry for truth. It was a Western Samizdat, a clearinghouse for dissenting opinion, some of it sound, a lot of it off the wall, almost all of it provocative. Gata attracted an amazing spectrum of talent, knowledge, and energy. At one end, you had people like Reg Howe and James Turk and Ferdy Lips, who'd been writing on gold's monetary role for many years. These were the real gold bugs, the grand old men of the, the sound money movement. At the other end, you had the more numerous newbies, who sensed they were in the presence of an investment opportunity of a lifetime and couldn't have cared less whether we were talking about gold or pork bellies. But all were united in their recognition that the gold market was rigged, that the rig was officially sponsored and denied, that the rig would someday fail to market forces, and that mainstream commentary was mostly falsehood and spin. They were also united in their thick skin, their willingness to be tarred as conspiracy theorists for daring to question the party line. Recall that this was well before the Iraq War, that unfolding catastrophe that conclusively demonstrates the mendacity of the United States government. But here we are, six years later, and things have changed. So the question arises, should Gata change its mission as well? If so, how? As to the first question, I think the answer is clearly yes. For one thing, it seems to me a large element of the original mission, investigating and exposing the gold rig, has been achieved. At this point, any rational person who continues to dispute the existence of the rig after exposure to the evidence is either in denial or is complicit. Now, that's not to say there isn't a lot more work to do in publicizing the findings neatly compiled by John Embry and Andrew Hepburn, just that the case has been pretty well cracked. We see this in the fact that several of the more prominent early scoffers have publicly come around. Many others have done so quietly. One telling indicator is the virtual disappearance of the term conspiracy theory from references to Gata's work. For another thing, the original mission seems too narrow in relation to the larger truth. And what I mean by that is this, that the gold market is rigged is unequivocally true. That the rig is monstrous and maddening is also unequivocally true. But these truths are just part of a much larger, more monstrous truth, which is that the rig is run to prop up a monetary system that is immoral and in conflict with the foundational law of the United States. And here's where it gets tricky. The rig is just a means to an end, but it is a vital and an indispensable means to that end. The deeper you dig, the more vital it seems to be. Our monetary system is, after all, just a confidence game. If people lose confidence in the dollar, the system doesn't so much collapse as evaporate. There is no better way to undermine confidence in government's funny money than to let real money run free. So not to put too fine a point on it, if you stop the rig, you bring down the system. So what, you say? After all, the fiat monetary system is beyond saving. History teaches that it will collapse of its own weight in due course, irrespective of what we do or say. Moreover, a collapse sooner rather than later is theoretically preferable, as the damage will be that much less, and the regenerative process can commence that much sooner. But it seems to me that's just rationalization. I'm uncomfortable simply taunting fate by yelling, bring it on, because it, however correct and necessary and inescapable, will entail a massive problem for anyone directly or indirectly tied to the dollar. And that means just about everyone. 
because the reality is we're not talking about a garden variety exchange rate adjustment. At the risk of sounding melodramatic, we're talking about the collapse of a global monetary system, the biggest in history. Nobody can predict how it will play out. And a lot of what we take for granted will be up for grabs all at once. In the panic, there will likely be a widespread impulse to surrender whatever remains of individual liberty in return for an empty promise of security. There will be no shortage of dangerous quack remedies on offer. Moreover, the collapse when it comes is not going to be an easy thing to play for profit. We delude ourselves if we think we'll survive what's coming, liberty and property intact, just by hunkering down. In social breakdown and disorder at the heart of an empire, even those who had the foresight to protect themselves may well sleep uneasy on their hordes. In fact, given the propensity of desperate politicians to do or say anything to preserve their power, those who spoke the truth before the collapse could well find themselves scapegoated as parasites or profiteers. So it seems to me that those of us who have some sense of what's coming must do what we can to identify a way out and not simply cheer on a day of reckoning that will strike most people as a disaster. There's a pressing need for clear thinking on what comes next. This brings us to the answer to the second question, how should Gata change? Gata, it seems to me, is uniquely positioned to move into the monetary reform space. Indeed, it's already happening. Consider, of the 15 scheduled speakers at this gathering, no fewer than four are already the authors of serious monetary reform proposals. Hugo Salinas Price has introduced a plan for a parallel silver currency in Mexico. Reg Howe has published a plan for a gold-based monetary reform in Canada. James Turk has collaborated with Edwin Vera, the leading authority on the monetary provisions of the Constitution, to introduce a bill permitting a parallel gold and silver currency, digitized as well as physical, in the state of New Hampshire. Antal Fekete has published a discussion draft monetary reform bill as an appendix to an excellent book by Nelson Hultberg entitled <clears throat> Breaking the Demopublican Monopoly. You heard reference to that earlier in Antal's talk. Now something very important is going on here, a sort of spontaneous intellectual combustion. And it's all happening here at Gata, nowhere else. Just as the gold miners are largely silent on the rigging of the gold market, so the libertarian think tanks are largely silent on monetary reform. That says a lot about the need and the fit and the market opportunity. So what should Gata do? In short, advocate the restoration of a constitutional monetary system in the United States. Make it an express element of the mission statement. If necessary, set up a sister entity to carry that torch. Now why should an organization that is expressly international in outlook adopt such an America-centric orientation? Indeed, I understand that fully 75% of the delegates here in Dawson City are from countries other than the United States.